Come on along with me. Follow along with me. Back to a world that is easy and slow. Follow along with me. Follow the song with me. Let's go see how it was long ago. Like part of you back when your dreams are fancy free. Follow along, follow the song. Well, that song was okay, I guess, but it had its questionable elements. Back beyond the smart of you to that special childlike part of you, for example. We thought we could do something maybe more interesting than that, especially lyrically. So we did another version of the same song, and that one turned out like this. Try to remember the kind of September when life was slow and oh so mellow. Try to remember the kind of September when grass was green and gray was yellow. Try to remember the kind of September when you were a tender and hollow fellow. Try to remember and if you remember then follow. With the notes of Try to Remember <coughs> from the Fantastics, the longest running show in the history of the American theater, now entering its 17th year in New York, I introduce to you Harvey Schmidt, poser of the tune, Tom Jones, author of the words. Harvey and Tom have consented to appear here for us and tell us a little about the writing of Philemon the show you've just seen. How did you come upon this very unique idea? Well, the idea itself <clears throat> is from a book by Allardyce Nichol, British historian, a book called Masks, Mimes, and Miracles. And in the first page, the first paragraph of that book, there's a description of an actor clown named Philemon in 287 AD in Antioch, who became a martyr and was and is a saint in the uh, Greek Orthodox Church. So that idea came from there. But the real thing that fascinated me was, strangely enough, because you wouldn't think of it seeing the show, is World War II. I have felt and feel that the most dramatic thing that happened in my lifetime has been World War II. It's like a great uh, super coming together of forces of two different ways of viewing humanity. And I've always wanted to, like, try to write something about it, but perhaps obliquely without, you know, dealing with it per se. I I've always wondered, for example, if I had been, I'm not a political person, if I'd been in Germany in 1932 or 33 and had begun to be aware of what was happening, for example, with the Jews, would I have done anything? Would I have had the courage, because I'm also a very cowardly person, uh, what, if anything, would have pressured me enough to actually take a stand of any kind to just even say no you can't do this this is not as the boy says in the show this is not what human beings do and so that was the, the, the sub, that was the area that fascinated me the story came from ancient history but the the emotional thing came from my lifetime from World War II well uh, Harvey were you equally attracted to the story did Tom have to convince you well when he first mentioned it we were in Italy at the time, I had rented a villa over there, and we were working on I Do, I Do, we were writing that. And he mentioned the idea, but it was no more than an idea, and it interested me as an idea, but it was many, many years before we were actually to work on it. Curiously, though, one of the uh, themes that ended up in uh, Philemon, which you heard tonight, 
was a song that was written at that time, which I dreamed, it's the only time it's ever happened to me in my life, that I woke up and I, I had heard a piece of music in my dream. So this is about two days after I'd arrived in Italy, my first trip. And uh, I liked the theme and I went downstairs and played it. And uh, this is how it went. called the Monte Argentario. And this was always to us for many years, the Monte Argentario, the Monte Argentario. And I was always gonna write a lyric to them, but I could never find a rhyme for Monte Argentario. And I, I loved the melody. It, it seemed so evocative. And so I tried several times to, to set lyrics to it. And I do, I do. I did a lyric called, marriage is impossible. And that just didn't seem to fit with that august music. And so later on, it, it just, clicked we both thought my goodness this would go in Philemon and so it, it's one of the two songs that that were from the beginning oh, we did many versions of Philemon and everything changed many times but this song and uh, I love his face remained consistently throughout it it's interesting what you say you did many versions of Philemon yeah. yes uh, over a period of four years you did how many versions we did four complete produced versions at our workshop, our portfolio workshop. And each of the four was totally different. In fact, you would have trouble recognizing the first one as being even similar to what we ended up with. What were some of the changes from well, the first to the Well, the, the first one was very realistic, you know. And the first production was a, uh, and it had lots of people in it, lots of extras and campfires with actors by the campfire and so forth. And so lots of Roman soldiers and so forth. It was, uh, it was a very much more typical musical, and we thought, no, we didn't set out to, to, to have this experimental workshop to do typical musicals. We want to... So the next version was very uh, stylized, and it was full of those late 60s experiments, you know, uh, and it was very uh, solemn and intellectual, cerebral in effect, very distant, and that didn't seem right either. The third version that we did was like a combination of those two ideas, and we began to settle into place. And then the fourth version, we realized, aha, it will work if, the, if this man is older, if the clown is, in fact, not a young man, as he'd been in all the other versions, but if he's an older man who's had a son that he's left and so forth, then it all came into place. As a result, uh, as you pointed out, there were only two songs uh, from the original version. This dictated by the book change. You couldn't save more than that, or you had no desire to save more than that. You wanted well, to keep creating more. Well, uh, the book very strongly dictates it. And the style, as Tom was saying, I mean, uh, if you have a very formalized musical approach, that's very different than, like, the first one, which is very realistic, which had a lot of naturalistic kind of songs in it. We overwrite, anyway. It's a, it's a practice of ours. We did a musical version of The Rainmaker for Broadway called 110 in the Shade. Before we began rehearsals, we had, we'd written 114 songs for the show with the idea being that when we got in trouble out of town, we'd have anything they wanted. We could just go to the trunk, you know, and pretend we'd worked all night, meanwhile watching television and ordering things from room service, come out looking exhausted in the morning and say, here is your song. Ironically, in that instance, we had to write three new songs out of town anyway. A few years ago, you had your own theater in New York called The Portfolio, which was dedicated to your own work. Uh, this is a rather daring idea for composers and lyricists to try running theaters is a very expensive matter it's egomaniacal in fact well <laughs> uh you did it as i would I, I would think you did it because you wanted to try something you weren't able to try on broadway what was right. it we had at the time we did it we had i do i do running on broadway and the fantastics running off broadway and we had an income and we'd always wanted to have a theater and we knew if we didn't do it then we'd never do it because you get too scared after a while and so what we wanted to do was have a place to fail. How many seats? Uh, oh, it was just 100 seats. Mm -hmm. And it was just for invited audiences. In New York City. In the beginning. Yes. And finally, at the end of the ex four years of experiment, we did, we opened it to the public and to the critics, and we did four shows there. But uh, the thing was, we didn't want to always do what we knew we could do. We wanted to, like, experiment with originals, like mm -hmm. Philemon, with sometimes themes that were more serious, to see if musicals mm -hmm. could uh, accommodate other things. Mm -hmm. You know? I also wanted to explore with musicians, uh, like in terms of orchestration, which I knew very little about, just seeing how much you could use one instrument as, as many different ways. Like in Philemon, there are only three musicians, but there are times when we get a very rich sound. But that was a right, just as we were talking about the book, of much experimentation. 
and you, playing around with sounds. And that's that. interesting, Harvey. Uh, three musicians. What uh, were the various instruments and uh, things which weren't instruments that you used? Well, we really started bouncing off what the musicians could play. We were very blessed to have a percussionist who could also play the French horn and the pianist who could uh, double on guitar and a second electronic keyboard which make a lot of the strange sounds you hear uh, and she also played the recorder then we also have people just playing sticks at time and beating on walls or yeah, they play the of, wall sometimes yeah. <laughs> and drums. yes and drums. lots of drums play the and piano bench and the piano bench we also had some primitive instruments and we had a drum came from north africa with a human heart in it uh, uh, the heart of the animal oh, human hearts better <laughs> yes. uh. but it actually that was the thing they tried to capture the soul of the animal they put the deer's hide to make the drum and put the deer's heart this dried up sound inside you know what is an example of a song that you changed from the first production through to the last? Well, there was a song that the clown sang, Kakyan, as part of his street performance. And an earlier version of that song went <clears throat> so approximately, if you can remember it, like this. I believe in music, beautiful, beautiful music. Nothing is better than music. Music is given by God. I believe in laughter, singing and dancing in laughter. Tragedy's not what I'm after. Laughter is given by God. It seemed that long ago there was a time when life was slow. Man was an animal, you know. Then he discovered music ever since that painful day. Well, that, again, it's a nice song, really, but it's sort of innocent, bouncy and innocent, and we wanted, as the guy got older, we wanted to make him more like a comic. And also, this is a bit literary, in the dim and long ago, and so forth. So, even though we both loved that song, we got rid of it and replaced it. That was the first version, and replaced it in this version with the same, it sounds very similar, but we just want something a little more shtick comic, you know, a little more vulgar, too. Mm -hmm. Oh, give me a good digestion, a something to digest. If you provide some bread and wine, it will be the best. Just give the people to me, there'll never be unrest. I give me a clown to laugh at a lady who's undressed. Oh, give me a good digestion. in the show better for our purposes it's not as in some ways as interesting a song but it's better for the show for the character now all this started somewhere and I uh, you told me it was the University of Texas how'd you meet there Harvey how, were you interested in drama well I was an art major and uh, I went there to study art but there was an organization called the curtain club which for people who were not majoring in drama but with an interest in you know wanted to do something connected with the theater it was a chance to do little weekly shows, and that's where I met Tom, and we started writing shows together at that time. For us in the drama department, uh, they look down on musicals, as I, I think unjustly, because I happen to personally think that musicals offer one of the great opportunities for an art form for the theater of our time, because people accept in them linguistic magic, uh, presentational things, uh, theatricalism, things that are a part of great theater, in my opinion, the theater of Shakespeare, of Moliere, of the Greeks. But drama departments at that time, at least, and to a certain extent now, thought that musicals were vulgar entertainment. So for the, us in the drama department, we would sneak off and do musicals, you know. Well, now, were you interested in the time, Tom, in being a writer or an actor? I, I, I was a... Confess. Uh, I was, no, not a writer. <laughs> Goodness, no, I was a director. Oh, director. Know, I was a director. And uh, uh, what well, was we, the first we, moment you realized that Harvey played the piano? He was an art major. Well, in the Curtain Club, uh, when they do the weekly shows, mm -hmm. Everybody would bring Harvey a record of his Judy Garland number and say, you know, get this up by tomorrow afternoon. And, uh... and interestingly, prior to that time, I played the piano by ear and I played well, but I could only play in the key of C. Mm -hmm. And this was a tremendous uh, opportunity for me. I didn't realize at the time that people would bring me this record and say, I want to sing this next Wednesday night. And I was too terrified to tell them I couldn't play in that key, so I'd take it home and I'd listen and listen to it, and I just grope around on the piano until I find the key. Uh, Harvey invented how there's a to key. Okay, it's an example of that, Harvey. I think we're on to something. <laughs> I mean, uh, let's take a pop tune, uh, like... Uh... Dark's Town Strutter's Ball. Okay. I mean, the key of C was... I'll be down to get in the taxi, honey. 
But if they wanted to sing it in uh, G, say, I'll be down to catch it in the back seat. Now, for a skilled musician, that's very easy to do. But if I'm not a skilled musician, and I compose by ear, and I play the piano by ear. So this was a major breakthrough in an education for me to be forced to do this. And I was too terrified to tell people I couldn't play, because I could play well in the key of C. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so actually, that was a tremendous uh, thing that happened to me at that mm -hmm. time. And uh, The key of G. <laughs> well, I, I, that's where I could play in any key. And uh, But it was simply because of this Curtain Club experience that, that happened. And, a, and Tom, how did you switch over from being a director when you decided that... Uh, I, I just, the scripts that we got were just terrible, and mm -hmm. so I thought, well, I can do better than this. Might as well give it a try. Yeah, so uh, we did them. And that was the beginning. To a great present, and all the beautiful songs you've done, and Fantastics, I Do, I Do, 110 in the Shade, and Philemon, for which we thank you so much. We're so grateful here at KCET in the Hollywood Television Theater that you permitted us to do this remarkable work. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Norman.